The company, which has an operation based on the Queensland Gold Coast, believes its split-cycle process will revolutionise the internal combustion engine. Former Newcastle businessman Brian Bambach is a founding member and director of the project, which has grown into a company now supported by almost 3,000 shareholders keen to see Australian ingenuity succeed. However, European industry is expected to be the first to utilise the technology. Definitely the nation of Slovakia has, has signed the heads of an agreement to manufacture the uh, industrial spectrum of, uh, of, of, of technologies, that is the air compressors and hydraulic motors for world consumption. They believe they can do it in 18 months. Split cycle is claimed to have a number of advantages over conventional engines, being 10% of normal engine size, vibration free, virtually maintenance free with significantly fewer moving parts. The company also believes their engine can combat greenhouse gas emissions. At the current time we're getting 25% of our power from the use of water as steam. We know we can go to 60% uh, uh, water uh, with 40% fuel uh, uh, and that will make a big bearing on the amount of fuel that's being used around the world. In addition to engines, Split Cycle is also diversifying its activities with plans for several other projects. The guided missile frigate was assembled in Melbourne with some sections built in Newcastle. In early December, the Navy's newest warship made its way up the east coast to Sydney and eventually Newcastle. Reporter Peter Ryan was on board for the trip. The new ship is the sixth in a range of frigates built for the Royal Australian Navy and the first RAN vessel to be named Newcastle. Frigates are the frontline ships to protect Australia from air and submarine attacks. En route to Newcastle, the 180 crewmen went through simulated war exercises. The pinnacle of HMAS Newcastle's visit was its commissioning, the service led by the ship's commanding officer, Rowan Moffat. The vessel spent five days in port, the time proving busy for all concerned. There were also celebrations in religious circles this year, with Newcastle receiving its new Anglican Bishop. Sri Lankan-born Roger Herft was enthroned as the city's 11th Anglican Bishop during a ceremony at Christchurch Cathedral in May. One other man making his mark this year was Marundi farmer and part-time adventurer Peter Norville. In November, on his second attempt, Norville flew solo around Australia non-stop and in doing it smashed the record, taking just 40 hours to complete the flight. Another event to break records was the NBN Telethon to aid cancer treatment in our region. For 24 hours one March weekend, the NBN studios were abuzz with people taking calls from residents making donations. In Newcastle in November, the Civic Theatre officially reopened after having a $12 million facelift. Built in 1929, the Civic heralded the introduction of talking pictures to the people of Newcastle. Since then, the Civic has undergone two major renovations, in 1973 when it changed to live theatre and last month when it was reopened by the Governor of New South Wales, Peter Sinclair.
However, the pomp and ceremony of opening night was marred by controversy surrounding the specially commissioned play A Rare Jewel. The play nearly didn't go ahead because Newcastle Council had failed to clear copyright. At the 11th hour, permission was granted, but changes were required. The major one, the actors weren't allowed to perform in costume. Instead, they appeared in black. From one stage to another, and in June, the region's school students showed they're a talented lot. The school's extravaganza, Starstruck, held at the Newcastle Entertainment Centre, saw more than 2,000 students from kindergarten through to year 12 play to a full house almost every night. The two-hour production featured a 15-piece show band, jazz and marching bands, a 400-voice choir, dance ensembles and 15 soloists. Two months on and this time at the Sydney Entertainment Centre, four schools from the Hunter and Central Coast made the state finals of the Quit for Life Rocker Stedford. So competitive the event has become, it's divided into two sections, one for newcomers and one for schools which have won in previous years. Newcastle St Francis Xavier College, last year's winners, finished second in the Old Hands category. In the Rookies Division, Terrigal High took top honours. The latest section from Freeman's Waterhole to Minmai was opened in December by Federal Transport Minister Bob Collins. The $175 million addition extends the motorway by 19 kilometres. But drivers heading beyond Newcastle on the Pacific or New England highways face temporary road links, including Lenigan's Drive Black Hill, which could fulfil that role for up to six years. Early plans had the National Freeway, which feeds into the New England Highway near Black Hill, finishing at a stop sign. But after safety concerns were raised by local residents, the federal government proposed a $6 million band-aid, building additional lanes and traffic lights. Meantime, the search is on to determine the path of the F3 connection to the New England Highway at Brankston. Five routes are being considered in an EIS, with three of those alternatives through the Curry Corridor. It's going to take about a year to complete the EIS um, and one of the reasons for that, can I say, is that this is some of the toughest country in Australia uh, to build these kinds of projects through and so the EIS uh, process is extremely important. New roads also for the Central Coast, with $48 million spent on converting the existing single lane highway at Carryong Hill near Gosford to a dual carriageway. July marked the start of the new Local Government Act. This meant the title of alderman changed to councillor, leaders were called mayors and the word shire and municipals were omitted from council names. In October, leaders from local authorities throughout the state were in Newcastle for the annual New South Wales Local Government Conference. Other major initiatives on Newcastle Council's agenda included work on Honeysuckle, a government-funded project designed to revitalise Newcastle's inner city. Locating Newcastle's new landfill site proved controversial for Council. After many months of consultation and protest by local residents, the Summerhill was selected. It was a changeable year for Lake Macquarie Council with the resignation of Mayor Doug Carley and the retirement of General Manager John Rankin. Early in the year, councillors were concerned about Mayor Carley's health. After his impromptu holiday in Fiji, their dissatisfaction with his performance peaked. He faced a vote of no confidence from his fellow councillors and the Labor caucus. But when caucus members arrived at council for a meeting to discuss the Carley affair, they couldn't get in. The Mayor inside turned camera shy. If he won't let you in the building, that's not our fault. And we have every right to be here, and the people of Lake Macquarie have every right to know what's going on. Eventually, they did enter, a short time later, emerging for this statement.
The mayor resigned in May. Independent councillor John Kilpatrick was elected. Among the issues tackled by Mayor Kilpatrick were encounters with the developers of the Caves Beach and Green Point sites. On the central coast, Gosford Council successfully introduced a curbside recycling scheme, while Wyong Council faced public outrage over a proposed multi-million dollar redevelopment of a beach resort near Bateau Bay. Port Stephens opened its new chambers at Raymond Terrace and also got a new mayor in Crichton. A major event for Musselbrook Council was the visit by New South Wales Governor Peter Sinclair in May. At Scone, much of the year was taken up with a multi-million dollar plan to expand a local piggery owned by Brown and Hatton, a company which has Prime Minister Keating as a shareholder. The proposal went before a commission of inquiry. So far, there's been no decision. In September, around 100 people were retrenched at the Curry clothing factory Depict Fashions. The reason attributed to the government's tariff policy, making overseas imports cheaper. In the mining industry, it's been far from a good year on the employment front. Several mines in the region closed or sacked staff. More than 90 coal miners from the Pelton Ellalong mine in Cessnock were handed their notices in November. This brought the total to 900 mine workers retrenched in the northern region in the last two years. Last month, mining giant CRA sold its three underground mines in eastern Lake Macquarie to a consortium. The takeover resulted in the closure of Mooney Colliery and the shedding of 60 jobs. Then there was the 40 sacked Newvale miners whose plight to save their jobs and mine represented a battle of David and Goliath proportions. In March, the miners walked from Newcastle to Parliament House in Sydney, hoping to convince the Fay government to allow them to lease the state-owned mine. A parliamentary inquiry assessed the commercial merits of the miners' bid. It was determined unviable. Environmental issues also sparked large-scale rallies. In July, thousands of four-wheel drive enthusiasts and loggers protested in Gloucester over a plan by the Wilderness Society to have the Barrington Tops National Park and several adjoining state forests declared wilderness. If the proposal is successful, it would close the area to all forms of industry and recreation except walking. The Wilderness Plan is soon to be considered by State Cabinet. Local police were also on the protest trail over a forced transfer system which would see dozens of them working in Sydney to relieve those currently in the metropolitan area. During a visit to Newcastle by Police Minister Terry Griffiths in October, the families affected by the transfer system expressed their disapproval. If we find that policy is not working, then we'd be sensible enough to re-look at it. But somebody has to come up with a sensible plan that is fair for everybody. To the crime-solving job itself and August saw the sentencing of Malcolm Baker, the man who went on a shooting spree killing six people and wounding another on the central coast last year. Among the people Baker killed were his own son, former de facto wife Kerry Gannon and her sister Lisa. It's believed a breakdown in the relationship between Baker and Kerry Gannon sparked the shootings. Emotions ran high during Baker's trial in Newcastle. In capital punished. Punishment, yes, that might stop something. I mean, I love my country, but my country is letting us down. I'm left with no daughters, no grandson. My sons have got no father. Malcolm Baker was sentenced to life imprisonment. A month on and birthday celebrations among three friends at an inner city Newcastle apartment ended in a dispute and a triple shooting. Fire officers arrived to fight a fire in the flat, only to find 53-year-old Anika Kalethska and 69-year-old Pavel Gombard both suffering gunshot wounds. At the same time, the third person in the flat, 55-year-old Alexander Radoskovich, ran to a nearby medical centre seeking treatment for gunshot wounds. The woman died at the scene. The two men were taken to John Hunter Hospital, Radoskovich later released. Gombard has been charged with murder and attempted murder. He's being committed for trial next year. 
Then there was the shooting that sent shockwaves through the police force. In April, 21-year-old Adam Reid, described as a volatile loner, entered Nelson Bay Police Station, disarmed Sergeant Jeff Smith and shot him twice. Reid then ran outside and shot himself. In September, a man and a woman died while another woman suffered serious injuries during a stabbing spree in the Lake Macquarie suburb of Cardiff. The elderly Ukrainian victims all lived within streets of each other. Alexander Wyback, also Ukrainian, drove the three to church every Sunday. Police located Wyback in a Ukrainian church and arrested him in relation to the stabbings. He'll stand trial soon. Following a four-year inquiry into mental illness, Human Rights Commissioner Brian Burdekin delivered a scathing report about the lack of services and the difficulties facing people with mental illness in Australia. Two weeks before his report was released, Commissioner Burdekin gave NBN reporter Jane Anderson a revealing interview indicating the extent of the problem. He said the government's policy of moving people out of psychiatric hospitals and into the community has largely failed. We have left them in hostels, in boarding houses, in the community, completely unsupported. Um, we've left them without the facilities, we've left them without people to monitor their medication, to gain care for them when they need care, to get hospital treatment when they need hospital treatment. And that's, I believe, one of the great uh, tragedies and indeed it assumes the proportions of a national scandal. Another topic dealt with by NBN was suicide. More people in Australia die from suicides than motor vehicle accidents. Again linked in with the Burdekin report, it was revealed Australia has the unenviable reputation of having the highest youth suicide rate in the industrial world. The number of youths committing suicide in the 20 years has tripled. Brian Burdekin claims the lack of services for youth in rural areas has accentuated the problem. Another NBN exercise which caused unprecedented community reaction was Project Restart, a television program aimed at teaching the life-saving skill of cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR. Around 8,000 people turned up to free lessons conducted one Saturday in December by ambulance officers throughout northern New South Wales. February 13th proved a black day for the rescue helicopter. Angel One had been attempting to land in the Barrington Tops to retrieve an injured bushwalker. In bad weather and poor visibility, the Dauphine machine clipped power lines and crashed into a paddock near the Barrington Guesthouse west of Dungog. The crew survived, but unfortunately the injured bushwalker died while waiting for help to arrive. The search began for a replacement aircraft. Three weeks later, a temporary Bell 212 was leased from the RAF in Western Australia and after a worldwide search lasting nine months, the hunter's new permanent rescue helicopter arrived. The Bell 412 was bought in Japan for around $3 million. More than $700,000 of that was raised through donations. Among its features, the capacity to carry five stretcher patients in one lift. The Bell 412 has carried out more than 160 missions, confirming its valuable role in the community. Community. From air to sea rescue and the Lake Macquarie Coast Guard was also left searching for a vessel after their boat became a casualty of big surf off Swansea and fire officers had more than their fair share of work this year. In November officers were called to this fire in a flat in Hamilton. While they fought the blaze, paramedics treated the unit's tenant, 33-year-old Harold Boyle, who suffered second and third degree burns to 30% of his body. A 35-year-old next door neighbour was also burnt in the fire. He was later charged in relation to the incident. Another house fire in Mayfield revealed the heroics of a nine-year-old girl with their mother and sister away. Kira Griffin was inside the house with her brothers and six-month-old niece when the blaze broke out. Neighbours helped evacuate the children. Kira grabbed the baby and ran.
I thought that she was already dead because the smoke was up in there and we were nearly touching the beanbag. In November, two children died in a flat at Waratah. Two-year-old Jared Ting and four-year-old Carol Ann Milton were playing in an upstairs bedroom where it's believed the fire started. As adults celebrated a neighbour's birthday downstairs, the children became trapped by the flames. I could hear Carol Ann, but I just couldn't get to her. The toddlers died in hospital. It's thought they may have been playing with matches. Also in November, one of Cessnock's oldest homes was completely gutted. Neighbours and passers-by helped out, but there was nothing they or fire officers could do. 100 years of history gone in 20 minutes. Since Monday, the six riders have spent eight hours a day on their machines to raise money for the Children's Hospital. Several jet ski manufacturers were originally major sponsors for the bid, but withdrew their support when they learned how fast the group planned to cover the 800 kilometres. They weren't sure that we could make it, and so they pulled a pin on us. When they pulled a pin, some other people pulled a pin on us as well. But they managed to cover the distance with few mechanical problems or personal injury. Local federal politician Michael Lee joined them for the last leg and says he's astounded they all finished so well. I thought if you hit that many bumps between North Entrance and Tookley and you hit that much spray, it must have been a tremendous job on their part to get all the way from Tweed Heads to the Central Coast. And when they stopped, they didn't waste any time reaching for the refreshments. And like all good seafaring stories, they came across a monster of the deep. We've seen a, a white pointer at Seal Rocks, about 15 foot long. The, the, um, the local diver says about 18 foot long, but they probably you know, exaggerate a little bit, we don't. Final counting is still going on, but it's anticipated the run raised around $10,000. They broke the existing jet ski marathon record by 700 kilometres. Documented proof will be faxed this week to the Guinness Book of Records office in London for accreditation. Around 100 volunteers began fighting this blaze off Mulbring Road near Curry last night. It was thought to be under control, but this morning gusty winds whipped it along and before midday the blaze was heading rapidly eastward. The road was closed as the front of the fire loomed. It crossed, forcing firefighters to retreat. The road remained shut for most of the day. Traffic was diverted through Cessnock. While units tried to head off the fire, others were diverted to the Richmond Vale Rail Museum. Two carriages were lost as fire ringed the site. Other historic rolling stock came close to being enveloped. While brigades were working to put out spot fires, the historic number two mine shaft caught a light. The blaze was extinguished, the building damaged slightly. Also lost were around 500 sleepers. The track will have to be replaced. It could take months before the museum reopens. It doesn't look good, but so far not a great deal of uh, damage has been done to our rolling stock. Some we've lost, uh, but for the greater part we've not done too badly so far. Meanwhile, the situation at Dural has intensified. The fire has raced across all control lines and has travelled more than 15 kilometres. It's only two kilometres from the township of Bulga. Evacuations could start there soon. The blaze at Howes Valley has also flared and is now heading towards Mangrove Mountain and Kalnura. It passed through the Wallabadar area today. No property was lost. 20 fire units are on their way from Victoria. They will help tomorrow when the situation is expected to be critical. Jody McKay, NBN News.
Police officers turned out en masse at the Beresfield Crematorium to honour Inspector Terry Ducker, commander of the Hamilton Patrol. The 55-year-old officer received a commissioner's commendation for outstanding policemanship with rescue and recovery in the Hamilton area during the Newcastle earthquake four years ago. The highly respected officer passed away earlier this week following a brief illness. This afternoon, ambulance officers were paying their respects to one of the service's most decorated officers, Max Schultz. He was recognised for bravery over his rescue of a youth from a sea cave at Fraser Park in 1978. Helicopters and fire trucks set out in search of fresh outbreaks this morning, but there were none. Units are still fighting one skirmish in the Fern Bay area, but instead of the 300 firefighters toiling through the worst of the crisis, now only 30 patrol the fire fields. This has given us a golden opportunity to arrest some people and uh, let them start to uh, wind themselves down. It's been a fairly high keyed operation and a golden opportunity now for them to, uh, to wind themselves down and start to get back to a normal way of life. Senior officers had nothing but praise for the efforts of volunteers, emergency services and community groups. Of the 2,000 homes under direct fire threat, two were lost. 100%. Uh, you can't go any higher than 100%. They say if you could, I would. Many faced scenes such as this, a fire raging out of control at Madawi last week, devouring 5,000 hectares of bush. A 15-year-old has been charged with lighting it. What sort of penalties can uh, somebody facing those charges expect? Oh, they can expect, uh, under the Act, the, it carries a penalty of uh, 12 months imprisonment or $1,000 at this stage. Heading home today, a contingent of Victorian Country Fire Authority personnel who'd braved the worst of the Bay fires. Well, they're totally different to what we have in Victoria because when it blows down there, it blows one direction. But up here we've had anything up to five and six wind changes within an hour. What's the general feeling of the fellas you've been uh, working with up this way? Oh, they, they, they're enjoying it. Uh, they know they're doing the right uh, They want to go home, have a rest and come back again. The northern end of Catherine Hill Bay turned on 1.5 to 2 metre waves, some breaking for more than 200 metre rides to the shore. The competition has been intense with a field of 120 surfers, vying for trophies, a trip to Bali and a clutch of prizes. In the open division, Justin Lee, who's made the finals for the past eight years, took out his overall win. Second was Daniel Frodsham and then a three-way tie for third, resulting in a points countback and a placing for state champ Damien Iredale. Wetsuits and invitation status to next year's event went to other finalists. First in the over 28s division went to Lee Pitt, then Phil Adlington and third to Tony Ray. Roger Clements cleaned up in the over 35s division ahead of Larry Forbes and Catho local Ken Gill. Phil Davies, who surfed well through the comp, came in sixth on a technicality. Several thousand fish were washed up on the shores of Lake Macquarie near Cam's Wharf. Local resident Brian Hadfield made the discovery today. When I came down to get on my boat, all this foreshore was covered in dead fish. 
New South Wales Fisheries is attributing the blame to fishermen using nets for their catch. By law, the small fish have to be thrown back into the water. On unusually hot days, uh, they often have problem with uh, the methods of handling the uh, nets. Um, they often have a lot of blubber that uh, sometimes suffocates the fish. Killed were small brim, snapper, flathead, but predominantly tarwine. They're a, a very soft flesh fish and they do get stressed rather easily and um, I'm suggesting that they were knocked around or handled badly. Investigators with the fisheries department believe they may know who was responsible. In the meantime, the clean-up is continuing. Jane Anderson, NBN News. The Hunter plays an important role in the recently launched Seven Wonders of New South Wales campaign. The area is well known for its wineries and beaches, but there is much more to the Hunter that's still to be discovered. Morpeth is an attraction of a different sort. The quaint town was host to Tony Thurwell, newly appointed state manager of New South Wales tourism. He was impressed with the range of attractions the region has to offer. It's just a, a great place to come and visit, not just for the wineries, which I think is the, the traditional image of the Hunter, but for the, you know, the history of a place like Morpeth, which is just you know, a beautiful place to come and visit. The new freeway is expected to increase tourism, with people taking advantage of the easy access to the Hunter from Sydney. The closer it gets to Sydney, the more visitation you're going to get. As I said, not only from those people who live in Sydney, but from all those um, international interstate visitors who come to Sydney who want to get a bit of an experience of something other than the big city itself. The many Morpeth craft shops are and will continue to be a drawcard for those tourists looking for something a little different. It was a game of missed opportunities. The goal mouths under heavy fire, but many of the shots slightly astray. Breakers keeper Clint Gosling kept Wollongong at bay in the early stages. Standing alone when weaving attacks, slipped the defensive cordon. But the breakers rallied, sending up Warren Spink for a strike, edging this one in for the first points on the board. With the crowd urging them on, the breakers set up a cross that had to go in. Jennings floated the ball, Rod Brown forgot his own footing to connect. Second half and Wollongong squandered a free kick deep in breakers territory, but no mistakes next time with a well coordinated start to the comeback trail. Wollongong were using their heads to bring the scoreboard up to two all. A rain shower seemed to dampen the breakers chances of victory and brought with it another bracket of near misses. The scoreboard remained unchanged for the rest of the match, but Breakers striker and captain for the night, David Lowe, chalked up a personal victory, his 300th National Soccer League game. <laughs>